Good morning, everyone. John Colmel. Uh, I'm back in the seat to again uh, welcome you to uh, the September Joint uh, Authority and uh, Canal uh, Board meeting. With me uh, this morning, fellow trustees Dennis Trainer, Mike Bel Balboni, and B. Gonzalez, uh, Tracy McKibben, and Tony Pacente have uh, been appropriately excused. Uh, Justin and uh, the rest of his team are with us and or will be uh, joining us throughout the course of uh, our discussion and dialogue. And with that brief intro, I'm pleased to uh, call this meeting uh, to order. Uh, we've all had an opportunity to review the agenda and materials provided. Unless anyone has any changes or questions thereon, I'd ask for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Uh, Second. Michael, thank you. Uh, Dennis, Michael, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Uh, motion passed. Uh, contractors list. Karen's, uh, as she always does, uh, advises us of all those uh, benefiting from uh, the approvals. And uh, unless there's any other updates, uh, I'm assuming that uh, everyone's had an opportunity you know, to appropriately review and respond. As we typically do, uh, we're going to uh, begin uh, uh, our meeting uh, with a relatively brief half hour, 45 minute uh, executive session. If I could, I'd ask for a motion to conduct uh, that executive session pursuant to section 105 of uh, the public officer's law. So moved. Move second. Move second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 We will uh, adjourn uh, to uh, executive session and we'll be back in front of all of you uh, in a little bit. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome back. We are live. Welcome back, uh, everyone. If uh, I could ask for a motion to, to resume the meeting in open session, Dennis, thank you. Michael, second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. We're back in open session. And as always, uh, reaffirm that no votes uh, were taken while we were in executive session. Uh, our meeting today is uh, includes a series of uh, presentations, uh, many of which are uh, traditional by our officer team that said uh, got an exciting presentation in terms of the Eureka challenge. So we're all uh, uh, look forward to that. Brian Stratton's also joined us uh, today. He'll give us a great update on where we are with uh, many of our important uh, canals uh, initiatives. And uh, we'll close with a couple uh, committee reports. So the next hour and a half, uh, get a good feel and flavor for uh, where we are, where we uh, stand and kicking that off as always. Uh, our esteemed leader, uh, President and CEO, uh, Justin, the floor is yours, the pulpit is yours, the podium right. is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Morning, Morning. trustees, NIPA colleagues, members of the public, and our guests today, welcome. Uh, as we sit here heading into, uh, heading into the fourth quarter, I have to say, I think we're, we're, really, um, we're really firing on all cylinders and we're gonna be in a position to close the year out uh, strong, as you'll hear from my from my colleagues in, in senior management. Um, so today I wanna to talk to you about innovation. As I, I, I've said to you before, you know, I think to think about the role that NIPA uh, is playing. We wanna be first, continue to be first movers. We wanna be known as first movers and innovators on behalf of our customers in the state. That's gonna be the theme. And I think we've actually heard some, some discussion of some of our innovative um, efforts earlier today in the governance committee. But, um, Today, I'd like to talk about innovation from the top down and innovation from the bottom up, which is what Eureka is all about. So one of the ways we're innovating now is through policy development. And um, we take advantage of policies that are available to us. And as you all know, the federal government just passed the Inflation Reduction Act recently. And that's going to, that's going to inform some of our innovative thinking around the authority because it's going to open doors to us that weren't available to us before. So as you know, the IRA does a, a few things uh, beneficial to our operations. One is, um, as you may know, the public power industry over the last several years has been fighting for reforms to allow public power entities that don't pay taxes to get the benefit of these tax credits. And so one of the key elements of the Inflation Reduction Act is the enactment of this debt direct pay provision, which now levels the playing field between private developers that would take advantage of tax credits and build that into their financial um, you know, proposals and public power like NIPA. So we'll be able to get essentially a check for the tax benefit to our project. 
So this will help us in, in many ways. Uh, it may it enable us to do more customer sited renewable uh, projects. Uh, there's storage um, benefits in there as well. So it, it restores also the two tax credits, uh, the ITC and the PTC are, are back in play that were um, you know, fought for by the, by the energy industry and so important to the energy transition as we go forward. And that you should know that uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is totally aligned with our overall Vision 2030 strategy. It fits very nicely through that. And, and in terms of the, our, our strategy, as we sit here today, we're, we're proud to say that we continue to innovate and two great examples of that that I'd like to share with you today are, uh, may, many of you may have seen that um, structure alongside our building outside. That's our, that's our cadenza battery, which is really a, a very interesting uh, effort that our R&D folks worked on that will um, help to prevent against thermal runaway in batteries uh, by essentially, as I understand it, segmenting the batteries uh, and isolating, isolating them. And what's, what's really significant about this particular development is it speaks to and, and seeks to address a problem with battery deployment, meaning in, in densely populated areas, right? Because there's an issue with placement of batteries in densely pop populated communities based upon the uh, potential for thermal runaway. And this is something that um, potentially can address that. So we're really excited. We received an award at the um, uh, Cloud for Utilities event, uh, uh, essentially uh, recognizing the important work that NIPA had done to, uh, to facilitate this, um, this research and development. And so we're very proud uh, to be sharing that with you today. Um, the other item that you'll see here today, you'll, you'll remember that we came to you, I think uh, a couple of years ago with our last, um, our last uh, challenge. Before uh, you jump to that. Sure, of course. Couple more, <clears throat> uh, B. No, no, I just wanted, um to congratulate you on the uh, smart energy. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's really great for our team to be recognized. Uh, it's a real mo motivator when your your work is actually picked up by the industry and recognized as being, um, you know, leading. And that's what we want to do. We want to be leading in and innovating for the industry, for Joe our customers. Look all that happy. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was photoshopped in there. He actually was in there that day. <laughs> so that that does the point. Um, so back, going back to the Inflation Reduction Act. So yeah, in of terms course. of uh, who we are, what we do, what we're about, does this change any of that dynamic? In terms of how we think, I mean, there's those that are always suggesting we should be something other than who we are, or yep. take on more, editorialize a bit for what if any ramifications there are, and sure. connect some of those dots. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's obviously still early, and and there's no shortage of uh, advisors that are out there combing through the the act and uh, analyzing it and and uh, helping us interpret where the benefits are for us. So I would say that it's it's a little early. The one thing that I did mention about customer sided projects and the availability of um, support for, for storage and, and uh, the ability to do projects like that uh, for customers, I think is something that will likely change our thinking. But I'd, I'd like to come back to you at a future meeting and actually show you, you know, where we think we actually can apply some of this, uh, some of these subsidy dollars to advance uh, NIPA's agenda and the state's overall goals. Okay. So the second, the second um, award is the um, the Israeli Challenge Award. If we could go back to the last slide, uh, this is um, and also an interesting, innovative project. We we had one round of this already, where we made an award. I think in 2020 or 2021. This is the second go round. It's led by Alan Etlinger um, in our R and D department, and that's Anat Katz, who's from the Israeli Embassy here in New York. Um, and we this. This award went to a company called Zoos, and what they what they've developed is a like a super fast charging battery for EVs, and so we're um, we're delighted to have been able to facilitate that technology, and hopefully share it with the with the EV industry. Um, and the Israelis are really forward leaning on on te technology in uh, in particular energy technology. They're really um, heavily leaning in in that area. And so the partnership between NIPA, that we like to think of ourselves as a first mover here in the States and Israel is really exciting. And, and it's something that the governor has recognized uh, on two occasions now um, as sort of me a meaningful partnership between uh, not only NIPA, 
but New York State and the US mm -hmm. and the Israelis uh, mm -hmm. in some of the great work that they're doing there. The, um, the next, what I, that's from the top down, now from the bottom up, um, you'll recall back in, in, um, in 20, 2018, we came to you with our first, um, our first Eureka challenge. And um, I wanna share with you some of the outputs from, from that exercise. That four years ago? Yeah, we, yeah, we were talking about that last four, night. It's four been four years. years ago, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you'll remember the, the great day yeah. we had when we when we made the awards to the winners last time around. So I just wanted to share with you um, a couple of uh, examples of what came out of that. We didn't just do the Eureka Award to recognize innovative thinking, but we did it in order to try to come up with ideas that would actually improve our operations here. So I'll share a couple of examples of, um, of, of aspects of the Eureka project and the winners that actually resulted in, uh, in, in benefits to the company. So the first one is, the, um, is what we call Watson, an administrative advisor. And so this is a, a custom built Microsoft Teams uh, team. And it's, um, it, helps, uh, it helps inform the, and pro and the uh, process of task work, processes uh, development. And uh, so it's, it's actually been applied in the organization and is actually you know, providing benefits in terms of uh, providing consistency and administrative processes and quicker ease of access to uh, organization-wide administrative tasks. So that was one winner, Watson. The next one- So it's being utilized today. Correct, yeah. And the, and the, or the organization is benefiting from it. The next one that we awarded was the uh, on-demand buoy system. This, this dealt with uh, some improvements in how we remove the ice boom. I know, Chairman, you're familiar with that process every year. Uh, it prevents ice from flowing into the Niagara River and, there, and thereby impacting our operations at the, at the plant. And so this is actually in, in, uh, in operation now and is helping the team uh, locate junction plates for quick and easy retrieval of the materials, thus, thus eliminating hazardous uh, days on the water. So another, another place where, uh, where, where that, the outputs of that work have come uh, come full circle and now benefit uh, the organization. So it's great to see that not only are we creative in our thinking here, but that thinking actually can be applied to and improve the operations of the authority. I hate to think that it's we're close to we're putting the boom back in again, but I guess uh, time mm -hmm. marks. Yeah, yeah. And finally, uh, the third one is um, our three D modeling. And this is, um, this is a use and awareness of special 3D scanning cameras and modeling technology. And it's become uh, more commonplace across NIPA. This was an idea that, an award that was made and, um, and again, in operation, uh, it's enabled uh, virtual bidding walkthroughs to take place and walkthroughs for electrical contractors of certain plant areas, which um, proved helpful during the COVID-19 pandemic in particular. So these are three great examples of the the benefits of um, uh, encouraging innovation in the organization. And before I turn it over to the HR team to, to talk about this year's winners, I'd be happy to take any questions on any of the, any of the materials that I previously uh, discussed. As uh, the competition over the last four years has that helped stimulate just ongoing sharing of uh, innovative thoughts and ideas, as opposed to, oh, I'm gonna save this idea for the next challenge. Uh, is there a steadier flow of, um, I'll use your phrase, bottom up or middle up uh, yeah. thoughts and thinking? What have you seen in terms of just any cultural shift or organizational dynamic as to how people respond to, yeah. hey, they will listen, they will adopt, they will adapt? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we're seeing anybody sitting on ideas waiting for the next round of challenges. I think it's, mm -hmm. we, we're enabling that thinking and we're encouraging people to come forward with ideas. There's no, there are no, you know, stupid ideas, right? We're, right. We want that. Right. We want them to be, uh, to feel confident in coming forward with ideas. And, and some of, some of our winners, you know, become rock stars around the organization too. They get, right. you know, and, and people want to follow that model and, uh, try to gain additional visibility by coming up with a new idea. And so, uh, so I think it's all positive. Take risk. We're willing to invest in support Correct. change and great. Yep. Terrific. Over the years, have you ever looked back on the things that have been brought over the last couple of years as to where they actually went? I remember years ago, there was a uh, um, 
it was a new type of wind turbine that was rounded, didn't mm -hmm. have big blades. Yeah, we were involved up in, in terms of where that kind of technology has gone from here. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you know, to the extent that we can, even if it is not really a, a, a a technology that goes to market. I'm sure there's learning out of every innovative exercise. And so our R&D team, I'm sure keeps track of, you know, what, what's been brought to market, what hasn't been brought to market, you know, troubleshooting, what, why didn't it, why wasn't it successful? And then you apply that learning to the R&D work that we're, that we're doing internally. Great. All right. With, with, so before you jump to sure. the next one, so we, my recollection four years old, but uh, wasn't to make this a, every four year uh, contest, obviously COVID and other things yes. get in our way. So what's your, what's your thinking relative to that? Yeah, I think we'll come back to you more rapidly than four years, you hit it on the head. It was, you know, uh, sidetracked uh, by COVID. I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, maybe it's a two year exercise, you know, to, to um, give, give those eyes, ideas a chance to come to fruition and see, you know, see if they're successful or not. So two years, every two years might be a good cadence. Okay, great. Okay, with that, I'm going to uh, call up the uh, HR team uh, to talk about this year's Eureka winners, Jessica Swanson. Okay, thank you, Justin. Good morning, Chairman, Board, NIFA colleagues, Canals colleagues, everyone here today. My name is Jessica Swanson. I'm the Manager of Organizational and Talent Development in the HR Group. And I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, I was here four years ago as well with the other winners. And um, on behalf of everybody here, all the winners, we're just appreciative of the opportunity to be here with you. So thank you very much. So the main purpose of the Eureka program, um, Carly, next slide, if you go to, is to really make sure you know, that employees' voices can be heard. So organizational engagement is really important, especially when we want creative ideas. Um, and through the competition, we did just that. But Eureka, getting at what Justin was talking about before, is an ongoing program. So it is actually not just only during the competition where people can submit ideas, but people can submit ideas at any time throughout the competition, throughout um, outside of the competition as well. So we're, um, what we're looking to do with the competitions, what we did this year, is to really energize the organization, hence having the competition. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, we will be sharing with you the winners, the four winners today. Um, and through the through the um, competition, we really saw our values coming through in every piece of the process. Um, we we're really excited um, to actually this year have the first year that our Canals employees were able to participate in the competition. We actually have a Canals winner here with us too, which you'll meet in a, in a little bit. So thank you to Rebecca and Brian and team and everybody who helped support that. Um, everyone really was able to contribute. We had NIFA management employees, union employees, and Canal employees all participate. Uh, we had over 100 ideas submitted. Um, we had our, our leaders come together and really work as one team. We had 10 evaluation workshops where the leaders came together and um, looked at the ideas in relation to our strategic pillars and priorities and narrowed them down according to that. So we saw the collaboration at the leadership level, at the ideators coming together and thinking through ideas together and building upon one another's ideas. Um, and ultimately, we had over 300 employees vote on the final winners of the competition. So the competition really was for the organiz organization, but also decided by the organization as well. Um, it was really a very inclusive process, which we're, we're very proud of. So through the um, competition, um, we have four winning categories or types of innovation here. And we're really intentional about making sure the winners um, come, from all, all, um, come from all types of the, come from all innovation types. Innovation doesn't happen only in certain levels or from certain people across the organization. It can come from anyone, anywhere with a great idea, whether you're working on assets, whether you're working in finance, whether you're in HR, um, there's always a process improvement and idea to be had. So we made sure um, you know, the ideas are submitted based upon these different innovation types. You can see here there's four types, so four winning groups, which you'll meet in a minute. Um, the, the types range from the enabling ideas, so more lower risk, um, process efficiency ideas to the big um, leaping ideas. So bigger, higher innovation ideas. So with that being said, I'd like to share each of the four 
winning um, video pitches. So the employees had to vote on these pitches that the finalists created. So for each pitch, I will ask the winning group to come up and um, they can um, you know, answer any questions so as well. was the voting open to the entire organization? Exactly. So 300 of the uh, entire organization opted to, exactly. to vote. Okay. Yep. So for the first category, our enabling Is category. Our campaigning and solicitation. Oh, yes. And yes. There is a lot. Uh, yes. PR people. Yep. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of working with our communications group and all our, our, you know, you know, we have a committee on this and there was a lot of, that went into it to putting the word out as well. So. So with that being said, I'd like to invite Vijay, our first winner, to come up here. And um, we are going to show Vijay's winning idea, his video pitch, which was the internal customer coordination task force idea. So Carly. Hello, my name is Vijay Thomas, and I work in customer project delivery. Communication is key to relationships. Our communication with our customers is strong, but we're lacking communication internally. Currently, our corporate structure follows the typical paths of communication within each department, but there isn't established communication lines between NIPA project managers dealing with the same customer, but in different departments. The problem with this is that the project manager for customer two might have a good idea, a lesson learned, or a key contact that the project manager in another program might need. We need to create communication lines that connect NIPA employees of different departments dealing with the same customer. We need to open a channel of communication and knowledge sharing between the customer-facing NIPA employees, which would help to improve collaboration and coordination within NIPA. Some combination of Microsoft Teams, CDEX, CRM, Project Hub and or customer task force meetings should be able to tackle this problem. But we need to expend effort to utilize this technology to create these avenues of collaboration. This is not intended to be a bureaucratic structure that hinders work or progress. It's meant to be something where we have collaboration and communication. It's simply communication lines to make us more effective. I think we can all get behind that for NIPA and for its customers. Congratulations. <laughs> well done, VJ. Really Thank you. Effective communication. You know, yeah. Good work. <laughs> Thank you. Great. What kind of response or feedback have you gotten from others as? Uh... Oh, I, I think um, everyone in, in my department, people, my peers, we're all, you know, this is a, a problem that we've seen and we just haven't figured out how to solve it. And, uh, you know, it was something that it was it was it was bubbling up and it was it was something that we needed um you know one of the things you know working with a lot of the other government agencies um in in my position what we see that other government agencies end up becoming is every group becomes very very siloed oh, right. and that silo just just yeah. hinders any kind of progress any kind of and you know as NIPA keeps expanding which is great we like we all just don't want to become like that and so uh, I think everyone's very excited, you know, to to figure out how to do that and continue to do that. And one of the, the, the really cool points was I was talking to someone who's been here for you know 25 plus years. And she was mentioning that, you know, back in the 90s, there used to be a uh, something called focus uh, where they would go out to the local hotel and and have a customer group, you know, gather together and and just talk about these ideas. And we kind of like lost sight of that, but something that we can definitely bring back. So it's kind of in that same vein. So where is the solution in the evolution stage? Is this problem identification or your, your solution? Is, is it being developed or has it been developed? So um, the interesting thing is the Project Hub initiative that's going on right now is already looking at, you know, the technology side, the software side of how to solve this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, within the next, you know, six to eight months, we're going to see the technology meet where, where we need to be in order for this solution to advance. The next point is basically just gathering the heads. And, you know, one of the things I, I call that a, a customer coordination task force, but I'm thinking even, you know, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sold on the name. I was, if we want to go back to that name focus and, you know, like we go with this idea of, you know, finding our, 
um, our customer's utility solution, right? And so we have these, you know, I, I won't say an offsite because I don't want to create any, you know, budgetary concerns, but we can have a meeting uh, where we, we all gather together with, you know, all the internal, anyone who's like, for example, I work a lot with NYCHA. So anyone who's working with NYCHA, I work with EJ a lot and all those different groups with internally, we all were just to meet together on an, on an annual, semi-annual basis. It would, it would help just to give us a focus on you know what solu- you know solutions we needed to get right, right? so need a, ca- Kaizen. a, a Kaizen. Kaizen. Need a Kaizen. yeah exactly yeah exactly well congratulations oh, yeah. thank you very well done Appreciate it. photo op photo op okay all right yeah. I'll be don't worry about it <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, and now I'd like to move on to our improving category winner. So I'd like to invite George and Michael to come on up while we play your video pitch as well. This idea is an internal social video sharing platform for employees, uh, tutorials or how to's. Hi, my name is George Jimenez. I'm a senior real-time systems engineer with the Operation Control Systems Group, and I'm based out of White Plains. Our Eureka idea is an internal social video sharing platform for quick employee-created how-to and tutorial-type videos. This platform would provide us the ability to create and access short, bite-sized videos that would relay the necessary details for NIPA employees to perform a specific task or to solve a specific problem. The videos would be accessed and stored via a centralized location that would be accessible to all of NIPA employees. And the videos would be organized, say, by category or topic and would be easily searchable. Our idea supports the Vision 2030 priorities of digitization and resource alignment by enabling our workforce with cutting edge digital tools and improving on access to information and knowledge. With key information at our fingertips, we can more quickly, effectively, and safely support our systems, our internal customers, as well as our external customers, both for us. Many of us perform similar work across different parts of the organization or in different regions. This platform would empower all of us at NIPA and Canals to share our knowledge and expertise, effectively breaking down silos of information and facilitating collaboration between all of our business units. Today, very direct. Both for us. Yeah, there was a campaign. It'll work. Yeah, well, yes, well done. Done. yeah. Well done. very fortunate. Yeah. Are these videos out there now? And this is an effort to uh, stimulate and support more and catalog and organize, or is it not a methodology that's embraced in light of current technology? I mean, you guys do a lot of this already, and we we do. I mean, there's there's se- yeah. several groups that they create their own videos of you know, little how-to videos, right? And they store them on their machines. Right. That's exactly. that's the only place where they live. Right. Uh, but they don't they don't get shared. Right. We talked about silos in the last presentation. Right. That's that's really what it is. You want to break those silos and in you know share all of that information with other disciplines and other groups and other sites and not keep them locally. You know. Close to one's chance. Sure. Good idea. Yeah, that That, knowledge transfer is a challenge. That, that, Mr. Chairman, this is such a great thing for that (laughs) issue of turnover, knowledge transfer, making sure that people still know how the systems, the older systems, particularly in NIPA, as as Joe Kessler has told me, there's so many systems that almost are pneumatic and and not digital. And so who knows how to work that? If you do this, you can still continue that knowledge base. That's great. Exactly. Thank you. Right. Exactly. Right. That's a good point. It's not just for new technology. It also applies for the old stuff, for the you know, for the uh, uh, more vintage type of equipment that only few have knowledge about. Do you have to? Do you have training for the vintage operators who may not be as skilled in the uh, social media platforms, or 
Is that part of your pitch as well, or you assume everyone has? Uh... No, you can't assume. You can't <laughs> assume. Yeah, I mean, right. if they need if they need help, or if there's a informal training, then we'll, we'll certainly provide that for sure. So you don't need TikTok expertise or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, you know. our vision of the platform is that it's user friendly and intuitive and Great. very straightforward. Good. Well, terrific! Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, great job. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, hop in here. That's not good. It's fine. Okay. Little people are behind anyway. Okay. Is that Michael? You're good. You're good. You're good. Stay yeah, put. I was too sideways. Okay, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, George and Michael. We could do a video on like about board meetings and how to do a board <laughs> meeting. Right. Like that. Great. And now I'd like to move us to our third category, our third winner, our leading winner. So Marissa. Here's Marissa from our Canals organization. Would you like to come up and we will share your video pitch? Marissa's idea was around Adventures by Disney Partnership Tours to reimagine the canals. So thank you, Marissa. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marissa Pester and I work with the Canal Corporation. One of the ongoing struggles with upstate New York is finding new ways to connect with out-of-state audiences and encourage them to visit our neck of the woods. My solution would be to partner with Adventures by Disney to offer exclusive family cruises along our canals. Adventures by Disney is a division of the Walt Disney Company that offers destination vacation packages all around the world. The division was founded in 2005 and has been offering unique family excursions across six continents for almost 20 years. They reach out to local vendors to book everything from accommodations to dining to group activities. And every tour group is led by two Disney adventure guides to ensure everyone has a magical time. The Disney name conveys quality storytelling and one of a kind experiences to audiences all around the world. By partnering with Adventures by Disney, NIFA and the Canal Corporation would be able to reach a wider audience and invite visitors from across the globe to explore New York's beautiful canal system. Families who enjoy an Adventure by Disney vacation to upstate New York will want to encourage their friends to explore Herkimer's diamond mines, get an up-close demonstration of how our canal locks work, or kayak along the Oswego Canal. From four-day cruises along the Champlain Canal to five- or seven-day cruises along the Erie Canal, the possibilities for adventure are endless. The timing's perfect because Disney had it shut down for Ian, so now they got to <laughs> follow up and pursue the canal so the waters are calm and the sun is shining. Right? Good. Um, again, it happened to you know catch you yesterday. This is the beginning of, a, of an outreach process, whether it be to Disney or others. Uh, yes, yes, correct? we are considering other companies such as uh, Tauk, uh, Yankee Trails, uh, in, intrepid tours, trail fogger, and anyone who would conduct uh, tour groups along our canal system for out of state visitors. Yeah, even if there's multiple providers and mm -hmm. in the like, right? So I don't know, B, I right. know you're an avid canal user, supporter. No, it's really exciting. And um, th the canal has embarked on a project to really make the canal story a more inclusive story, which I think will. Uh, will appeal to a broader audience, which is mm -hmm. really very exciting. Yeah, all yeah. of this can come together. Yeah, it's, it's terrific. And I'm, I'm sure Brian, you're, you know, you and your team are, we are fully embracing. Thrilled. We are absolutely thrilled. We put out a uh, RFP, I think, uh, back in the pre nifa days, I think in uh, 2013, 2014, for cruise companies along the canal. I don't think we got any solid applications, but I'm confident I'm, I am confident, Chairman, that all of the all of the support NIFA has has delivered to canals. We're going to be able to be able to lift that up now. And this is a fantastic idea. Yeah. We are immensely proud that 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 from Marissa brought us into the in, in into the the, the winter circle. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. it's terrific. Well, 
kudos. Uh, we're, so we're excited. Very nice. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's terrific. Congratulations. Good job. Thank you. Get the broader group here. Come on up. Come on up front here. Up in there. Perfect. That's good. Brian, can you step over this? Oh, like, like, like way out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Mr. Chairman, if I could, my the fact a fact that I learned when I went to a presentation about making the canal story more inclusive is that almost 40 percent of the canal workforce was a workforce of color as the canal was being built. That is something that most of us probably never would have imagined. Mm -hmm. Did I get that number right? Thank you for your advocacy. I think we're, we're in a real renaissance period. And well, and we're naming. Uh... Oh, yes. Very exciting. So next week at the Canals Conference, um, there is a tug being named after Harriet Tubman. And not only that, it's in the Rochester area where she grew up. And I guess representatives from the Douglas Frederick, Frederick Douglas family, as well as the Tubman family, will be a part of the presentation. Wow. That's right. very exciting. Right? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. So Great. good segue, good to you. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. Um, and now that brings us to our final winner, our leaping winner, winning group. This was a collaboration between a few different ideas that came in. So if you'd all like to come on up. We have Michael, Saja, Frank, Ray, Aman, Jeff, and John. Give us a number. Maybe we can have the folks on this side. For the, if you want to come over here. Must be really good. <laughs> <laughs> One, they're leaping, and two, there's a lot of them. <laughs> Greeting friends, Mike Chekovich here, part of Eureka team, NIPA Viz. NIPA Viz stands for Virtual Information Integration System. The idea our team of seven came up with is simply a cloud based VR, virtual reality integration system, which ties our existing information systems together and incorporates them within a single platform that will also provide a virtual site representation of our assets, our equipment, and our facilities. The implementation of this idea would give the end user, everyone at NIPA, quick mobile-friendly access to a virtual representation of the assets in the field as well as the information available on those assets. So imagine you're standing in front of any NIPA asset. You pull out your NIPA iPhone, you scan the QR code, and within a few seconds, you have on your mobile device all the available information associated with that asset right at your fingertips. Whether you wanted to jump into Maximo to look at asset details or the open work orders associated with it, jump into Pi Vision to see real-time information on that asset. It's all available in one unified location and the potential to add in a, a VR map with it. This idea would benefit the entire organization, whether you're an engineer working in the field or remote or a craft employee working on site, you can all pull up this information without searching too far. Audition or compete for who got to do the video? I drew the short straw. Oh, <laughs> there I was. They didn't even give you a chance to take your helmet off. Of that it must be high risk work in that office. You know, you're you glad you picked up on that. Safety first. You know. Um, well, give us a little bit of. So, how did you collaborate? Um, for the, do you guys all work together or no? You never work together, and you came together as a result of this opportunity. This is all. My team. Okay. So we are from White Plains. They are from Niagara and uh, ah, so three ideas, three different ways how we were looking at the problem, and it's one unified solution. One blended. Yes. Yeah. Nice. So rather than compete, you chose to collaborate. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not you have to do a vote on everything, right? You know, all the vote yeah. We eliminated the competition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always, always good. Always good. You got to join a winner. Uh, well, that's that's terrific. So again, help us with where the evolution of this is. Is this something that's in the works already, or no? This is. So right now it's kind this of is literally yeah, leaping yeah. us forward. Idea phase. I think we have the different pieces of information throughout, you know, different applications in Nipa and just the fact try to bring them all together in the one yeah. single platform and utilize all the functionality of the, the phone that, that can uh, that we can leverage. Part of this is already in development. I mean, the the operators at Niagara already use mobile devices to access information on the assets, you know, mm -hmm. do inspection rounds and that's all getting rolled out through the different departments, but there's there's so much more of that it could do rather than just be a, a mobile link to Maximo, you could incorporate everything into that yeah, platform right. so it's and, integrated and yeah. you know, not shown in that video, but you know, if we ever do have to work remotely again, a tool like this would give everybody the ability right, right, right. to. Yeah, we, yeah. we actually had someone from safety reach out and mention, hey, yeah. PPE or hazardous materials and, and different things like that. So, yeah, it seems uh, other people in the organization are interested as well. Yeah. And it can be expanded to anything, right? It's not only the operational assets, the laptop or anything which we sure. create a help desk ticket. You can just carry it from your mobile and it will pull up all the information. So it can be integrated with multiple systems with different ways and making the information easily accessible with for everyone. So what resources do need to be provided to enable uh, this and other ideas? So we've got all that allocated, Justin or Adam? Or? <laughs> we have sponsors associated, executive sponsors associated with each one of our ideas and that you know, talking through that next process is what would be a roadmap for this? What would be a budget needed in, in the future? All right, well. so that's part of the next step. Well, congratulations. <laughs> for the collaboration. We just set the, the pace and tone for this collaboration. Well done, Mike. Look, good job. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Need the wide angle lens. Yeah. 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 Get me in the back. I'm going in the back. <laughs> Go right up. If you guys could orient yourself this way, look, look towards me. You can come forward a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Let me sneak in here somewhere. Don't leave me out there by myself. Oh, so you're going <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're out there. I'm right here. Uh, yep. Yeah. Me too. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Okay, guys, hang on. Let me just make sure we're okay. Let's go here. Give a big smile. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our winners here today and for everyone's engagement and connection to the program. Um, our next steps is to connect the ideators with their executive sponsors. Each already have one assigned to them through our EMC members. Um, and making sure we're connecting again, the right people in the business who may be working on pieces of this already too, and make sure we're connecting with the right, right business stakeholders and exploring um, the ideas, bringing them to life. So excited to, to see where we're at um, next time we come together. So thank you very much for your-, your The other 104 ideas, what happens to them? I mean, so they, they can win the, the vote, but I'm sure there's a lot of good ideas yeah, in there. Yeah, definitely. So we enable or support them. Yeah, so we, <clears throat> we um, gave every person who submitted an idea an opportunity to receive feedback um, on their idea, whether it's still good to go ahead or not for whatever reason. Um, some ideas, some groups just loved every idea, you know, some of the, the evaluation sessions and they mm -hmm. want to go ahead with some of the some of the other ideas. So we're connecting the people who are in those evaluation sessions to the ideators and to make sure we're really drawing those connections so they can start talking about the ideas. Sponsor? I mean, have we got sponsors for a lot of those as well or? We have, there, there's for the evaluation, some of the tactic leads we've reached out to, to make sure that they can, you know, progress some of them. I know Sarah's reached out already to go through all of her ideas. So um, there's definitely engagement with the other ideas as well. Okay. Yeah. 
Great. Thank well, you. Well, it's so always much. energizing. Uh, as I remember telling Justin four years ago, it doesn't seem like four <coughs> years ago. Does it? Yeah. But uh, we were all you know, duly impressed uh, with uh, the intellectual, further displays the power of the intellectual capital of the organization. Always, you know, blows us away, um, you know, every meeting and uh, great opportunity to demonstrate that and encourage uh, and uh, welcome cre creativity and risk taking. You know, that's yes. what it's all about. So definitely, that's fantastic. This continues. Great. Keep submitting ideas because this yeah. continues yeah. throughout the comp after the competition too. Uh, so thank you fantastic. so much. Great. Thank, thank you. you for your leadership. All thank around. you very much. Justin, anything else uh, in your sphere? No, I think, as I said, I think we're heading into the uh, Q4 uh, in, in a very good place. Ready and, to finish uh, strong, you promised yep. us we're going to be. Uh, I did. You know, straight, straight A's <laughs> yeah, on the exactly, report card exactly. this year. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. All right. You'll hear from Adam. He's we're we're firing on all cylinders there as well. Bagger Vance. Yep. He's already <laughs> you know he's covered down every four, every month, so we're good with all of that. So, okay, super. All right, uh, Joe, you uh, presenting remotely or? Yeah, I can present remotely if you can hear me. Yep, the audio is working. We don't need a Eureka challenge on that. So, <laughs> Well, th thank you, Chairman Como and uh, trustees in the board. And uh, congratulations to all those Eureka winners. Looking forward to supporting that. And I also want to thank Carly and the secretary's office for putting my my report behind them because um, what a tough act to follow that's going to be. So I'll do my best to be as exciting and energizing as they were. So thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Carly. So good news right out of the gate, a little bit of a retrospective. Um, as you may recall, we were a certified um, uh, three years ago in ISO 55001. Um, that's a standard of our asset management practices. And we uh, recently just got our external audit and they reaffirmed our certification uh, for the next three years. So uh, I wanna congratulate the team, first of all. Um, this really includes a concerted effort uh, from everybody from risk to finance, HR, IT, and, and uh, of course, operations folks and others. Um, but when you hear things like um, integrated smart operating centers and, and smart M&D and, and uh, asset performance management software, those are manifestations of tools of really this overarching process, which uh, really is an assurance, not only for, for our own um, benefit to make sure that we're doing things right and keeping things in a state of good repair, uh, but also our customers so that they know and have confidence that we're, we're, we're measuring risk and finance and everything else in the decisions that we make around our assets. So we remain actually the uh, still the only North American uh, generation transmission uh, utility uh, that is certified nice. 5001. There are other utilities that have uh, single assets out there that are, are certified. And of course, internationally, uh, especially in the Commonwealth nations or other utilities that are certified. But after three years, we remain uh, still a, the only one which is a tribute to the team and the support the board gives us to, uh, to maintain these practices. So thank you for that. Next slide, please. So actually leveraging uh, you know, some of the discussion Justin mentioned about being forward looking and being first movers and also this theme of uh, the steady flow that you mentioned, Chairman Como, around innovation. Uh, you'll see in the next few years, uh, us leaning very heavily in the area of robotics uh, for the New York Power Authority. And this is just a quick chart to show the initial roadmap. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, we learned, and I'll focus a little bit on uh, the aerial systems or the drones in the next slide, but uh, th that we're really uh, categorizing several ways uh, robotics can be used. And you see the categorizations that we've uh, collaborated with EPRI and other utilities uh, in terms of not only the drones, but uh, agile mobile robots or dogs, we call them, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, you may recall recently we did our FERC inspection at uh, Niagara of our uh, tunnels. Uh, our conduits, if you will, for the water uh, with uh, unmanned uh, 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 underwater robots. But we're also looking at other innovative things like wall climbers and other specialty robots that are all intended to not only produce um, or increase productivity, but also to increase safety with our, our teams. The reality is these technologies are almost no longer a novelty. Um, they're really becoming sophisticated and the tools that we use with the robots are really where we're gonna focus our attention. So as you can see, we'll test and learn this year. We already are doing that. We have several use cases and we intend to deploy at scale our, uh, our program going forward in 2023. So you'll hear uh, some more about that and hopefully we'll have some great uh, um, images for you as we update you going forward. 
Uh, next slide, please. Again, focusing on the, the aerial portion of it, uh, this is where we had the most learning and we really leveraged it. Um, it kind of, it, it frankly goes back uh, more than a dozen years ago, we did have drones in our fleet. And at that time we were thinking about some very sophisticated uh, payloads and, and technologies to, uh, to support what we were doing there. What we've learned since then, and really uh, it took a disaster for us to kind of figure this out, but when we went to Puerto Rico, what we learned is really having a good high quality image is the key. So what we're after with uh, all these uh, cases is working with our vendors and again, the increased, increased productivity and uh, 3D modeling that we're was spoken to before that Justin talked about in our um, uh, previous Eureka competitions. These are all coming together now um, because when we have that high quality image, we realize that the solutions can, that, that we have are really processing thousands of images per hour rapidly identifying asset components and what we're able to do is create a three-pronged solution uh, where we have some mission management software, media management, and image processing. With that, we can actually use kind of in the ops, in the back room, uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to look for anomalies um, in our assets. And interesting to note, uh, already we have 53 of the structures that we've modeled in terms of SmartPath uh, that are giving us a twin to do that and give us a, a head start going forward on those assets. Next slide, please, Carly. Another area of emphasis for your operations, um, and this chart kind of indicates from the New York ISO's perspective that all of the, uh, the goals, what it shows is that the number of interconnection pro projects that are required to solve the decarbonization in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act um, creates a need to analyze many, many scenarios. And uh, what you're seeing by the slide and what it represents is really the cumulative proposed capacity in megawatts that's been proposed from now until 2028. As of mid uh, this year, the New York ISOQ had about 470 total projects. That's an order of magnitude higher than what they're, they're usually, say, five or 10 years ago, analyzing with their staff. And they are really, um, each individual engineer at the New York ISO probably has twice the number of um, of uh, cases that they're, they're looking at. And of course that can create a, a backlog of analysis. Um, the cumulative uh, megawatts for interconnection, including land-based wind, offshore wind, solar and energy storage is expected to continue to increase 10 times in the next six years from about five gigawatts this year to about 50 gigawatts in 2028. Um, and there looks like there's gonna be a potentially $20 billion total investment to get where we need to go in that time period. Um, the, from a long-term perspective, the New York ISO uh, has just published the resource outlook and is projecting over 95 gigawatts of new zero emission resources will be required by 2040. And that's two or three times uh, today's capacity of existing generators in the New York control area, which is essentially all of New York State. Uh, so we're keeping a close eye on, on what they're doing there. Uh, next slide, please, Carly. So what that means for the near power authority and our resource, of course, many of these will interconnect with our own assets, whether there are our own uh, uh, interconnections or other proposed con connections. And today, uh, 60 proposed projects as of the, the mid this year are really being analyzed. About uh, 10,000 megawatts of re renewable injection are being um, proposed and installed in there. And this creates about 500 uh, million dollars worth of assets that are being built by developers and others and ourselves included. But in, in many cases, New York Power Authority will have an ownership interest in those assets uh, going forward. Um, all of these, of course, are intended to uh, really focus on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and the decarbonization goals. Um, and this concerted effort and these, uh, looking for unintended consequences of, of uh, one scenario versus another is very complicated and the computing power is, is immense. It, it takes a lot. Um, but among the uh, evaluated projects that we anticipate is about $1.5 million for new assets built for the New York Power 30 by 2035. Good news is we're well positioned for this, I think, as an organization in terms of our intellectual capital. Um, we just recently merged in the last year, our, what do we call our production cost analysis team with energy economics and of course system planning to kind of have everybody uh, looking together to support the ideas that come from Phil Toya's team and NIPA development. Um, around things that they're doing, but all their, also, also other stakeholders, whether it's NYSERDA, um, the New York ISO, or other developers that we're working with. 
Uh, but there's a lot of ideas coming in and putting those people in the same room to look at all those contexts and push and pull for, from the finances to the technical aspects is important. And then going forward in support of construction of these things, we're also looking to uh, take a hard look and, and, and merge some of the functions around our, our construction cost estimating, which has really got to be uh, uh, significantly more competitive in, in the early um, estimates. Uh, we've always had luxury in our own assets to kind of be conservative in those estimates. But when we're talking about developing and competing, uh, we have to have a, a clear view of what we're doing there. Also, uh, taking a look at constructability and making sure from a technical perspective, these ideas will work. And of course, uh, continuing to value engineer as, the, uh, as these projects go into construction. So the good news is I feel we're uh, well positioned. We continue to work with HR and recruiting and retaining employees that can support these initiatives, but uh, we're gonna be realigning the organization to make sure uh, these competencies are available in support of uh, Vision 2030. And that would conclude my report and I would certainly entertain any questions. Uh, a lot in there, uh, thoughts, questions uh, from anyone? Clear. Uh, Okay, I would I would just add. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know that our knowledge of the grid and our transmission expertise, given the extent of the transmission build out, it's going to be required for us to meet our goals. puts us in a really unique position to really drive drive the progress toward those goals. So, just uh, it's it's a great role for us to play and a place where we can really be in, impactful. Yeah, a sweet spot for us all yep. the way around. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> underscores, yeah, the value add that we bring to everything and every opportunity. So. And I agree just how we continue to lean in and invest and, and ensure we maintain, you know, that competitive or collaborative advantage. So terrific. Okay. Uh, Sarah, on the commercial off side. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, trustees and colleagues, public. Um, it's an exciting meeting, actually, for me, just to see all of the great work that Human Resources is doing in terms of supporting the development of our people. I just uh, came off of a two-day all-hands meeting with the commercial ops team, and we had a great opportunity. Justin came, you know, and spoke to us, but we were really looking at how our work ties to Vision 2030 and really having an opportunity to meet each other um, for the first time in a couple of years. So there's a lot of energy in this room too as a result of that. So next slide could be too that I was at a concert last night, but who knows And I'm on my third <laughs> cup of coffee, but that's okay. All right, so uh, themes here, innovation and uh, strong performance. Uh, it's continuing from what we've already talked about, but on the electricity supply side, you've heard from Adam and myself, very strong results when it comes to the merchant uh, margin this year due to higher gas prices, setting the marginal cost of electricity, as well as just a colder winter uh, and the st strength of our hedging program. On the economic development side, I don't wanna understate how important uh, the people that are contracting our assets are not only to support the jobs creation and retention, the capital investments in New York State, but fundamentally these are long-term contracts that reduce the volatility of our, of our uh, hydro net operating income. And so I wanna provide kudos to the BPAC team and the CAMs that are working across the state to ensure that we have long-term contracts for our hydro. Uh, they have processed over 85 uh, awards this year. And we really are, supporting the transition uh, in the CLCPA in terms of green jobs and green industries, as well as allocating and providing additional volumes to disadvantaged communities and coming to innovation, really supporting new innovative industries, such as a semiconductor, hydrogen, batteries. Uh, we, we really are looking to lean in there and support the innovative industries across New York State. Next slide. Again, all green. I, I remember when I first started that you really liked the Christmas tree. And I mean, really, we're, we're getting closer to, to the holiday season. So maybe I'll throw some yellows in there for you, Chairman. But no, we have a really strong execution this year. And what I would call your attention to is 
for the capital CPCs, the second line in terms of the 302 million, we're on track potentially to have the highest number of contracts signed ever um, for our, with our customer facing business when it comes to clean energy solutions. And secondly, you'll see the robust pipeline in terms of the EV charging infrastructure contracts signed. Those are with our customers across the state. Niagara Frontier Transit Authority, we're working um, with, uh, uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, um, as well as, as, as the MTA. And I anticipate hopefully that that, that will become an even more robust pipeline uh, going forward. And going back to what Justin was saying about solar and storage and the opportunities for the IRA to have an impact on our customers, you know, we're on track for solar and storage for this year, but really see opportunities to counter the headwinds that we've been seeing in terms of supply chain, inflation, in getting those projects finished such that we can really accelerate the pipeline there. And lastly, in terms of innovation, I would highlight that the New York Energy Manager is part of the most recent EO 22, which the uh, governor issued for all state agencies. NIAM, which we built over the last couple of years, is going to become the source of record for GHG baselines for all state agencies across, um, across New York and will help track and ingest additional information and data such that we can really leverage that platform for the benefit uh, of the transition. Next slide. Leaning in on innovation, Justin keynoted the Advanced Energy Conference that was sponsored by SUNY Stony Brook. It was a very exciting meet, uh, conference there, lots of people. It was at the Marriott Marquis in downtown Manhattan, right in Times Square. And I can say, having been to Manhattan now a couple of times the last few weeks, it really is back. New York really is back. I've heard the governor say that, but uh, yeah, you can't get across the street. So that's a good sign, I think, for our economy more generally. But we're not forgetting um, the rest of the communities across New York State, the town of York, Aaron Decoy, right? Okay, good, because I was gonna do the, the French accent that sometimes they get in trouble when I say hustle. Okay, so uh, we're helping, uh, you know, no matter what the size of the community is, whether it's the larger uh, major five cities or the smaller ones, ensuring that they're able to capture energy savings, both in terms of GHG reduction, as well as just financial savings in terms of supporting their communities. And finally, you will have seen at the last Finance and Risk Committee, the new EV charging vendor awards that will, you will be uh, voting on today. But that again is supporting uh, the fact that we're really accelerating when it comes to the, tra uh, the, the transportation electrification. Next slide. And this is great. Uh, I, on Friday, I was at the Evolve New York 100th Charger Milestone out in Riverhead, Long Island. It was really fitting to be there. I was reflecting on that as I was driving down and I was looking at, first of all, it was a gorgeous day, blue sky, uh, fluffy white clouds, but Riverhead obviously has the Peconic River. It has the, the sound uh, to the north and it has the Atlantic Ocean to the south. And, and Long Island has 30% of the EV owners in New York State. So while Evolve is looking to support incorporating chargers where there is not penetration of EVs, we also are looking at supporting where there are to continue to accelerate that. Uh, and that was the first site in, in Long Island, and we will be having one in Comac as well as in Bridgehampton in the coming few weeks. And we've undertaken a lot of additional activities, um, as you can see in the small bullets, in terms of how we can leverage our partnerships with the IOUs, how we can leverage our partnerships with our sister agencies in terms of streamlining permitting, and really working with the New York DOT too to see the funding that's coming from the federal government if we can continue to help to put that to good use to accelerate things. Next slide. This is just a high level of the different customer segments we're working with. About 10% uh, of the uh, bus market within the transit uh, agencies, NIPA is currently facilitating the electrification of that. OGS is taking on a stronger role to support the state agency's fleet electrification. And we're in the midst of uh, looking at 100 level two chargers as well as public charging in New York City and across the state and 
What we see too is an emerging focus on electric school buses. There have been clean uh, green schools initiatives that have come out in the state of the state. And we're working with our, our partners and sister agencies to determine how best to fund those as well as accelerate uh, those uh, electrifications as well. Next slide. And just stepping back, this is the context for why we're doing this. 40% of the emissions in New York State come from the transportation industry. And you'll see on the right, the red box, that's really what we're targeting. The class one, class two light duty vehicles, as well as the buses um, and some of the medium um, and, uh, and heavy duty uh, a bus fleet. So again, NIPE is leaning in and, and targeting the largest uh, areas of focus. Next slide. And this is just a little more detail in terms of the policy drivers and all of the actions and initiatives that NIPE has undertaken. You can see we have an incredible relationship with the MTA and are looking forward to in the future, hopefully in the beginning of next year, sharing some additional great news in terms of supporting phase two of their electric bus initiative, um, as well as, as some of the other activities. Next slide. And finally, uh, this is just the cumulative progress. I, I don't think we can understate how strong this is. Uh, you know, we had the headwinds of COVID for two years, which really put us in, a, in an emergency response mode and really trying to ensure the safety and security of our contractors and our employees. But in, in aggregate, when you compare both Evolve as well as the customer facing charging that we're doing, we've uh, already supported the implementation over 350 charging ports and, and uh, utilized 80 million in contracts. And you can see on the right, we have a very positive trajectory and a year over year growth um, to continue to accelerate uh, and lean in. And I really believe that we're at a tipping point when it comes to the vehicles that are coming out from the OEMs, the interest that we see from the public. Um, and that is also supported both by the state's policies as well as the federal funding that's coming out to support the transport industry. So we'll look forward to coming back and sharing more, more exciting uh, news and milestones with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, thoughts, questions uh, for Sarah. Yeah, the school buses obviously has gotten a lot of focus on it, yeah. at least locally it has in Buffalo and the like. Mm -hmm. um, the, the availability of the, you know, the technology of the production is there, you know, supplier side. I mean, educate me a little bit more there as to how rapidly when you look at you back up a slide there, uh, you look at the growth and uh, for, you know, over the next couple of years, clearly you're leaning a lot into the, we're leaning a lot into the school bus uh, segment. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in there. I mean, in the end, what uh, contributes to the payback is the utilization of the buses. The challenge sometimes the school buses have is that they have a lower utilization than other tr bus transit uh, vehicles because they're used for a couple hours in the morning mm -hmm. and then a couple hours in the afternoon. And so the cost of the, of the electrification of those vehicles, uh, the payback is a little bit longer. Uh, but again, with the federal funding that's coming uh, as well as the focus by the state uh, we do have the vendors in terms of the buses themselves are rising to the occasion but for sure there's a lot of demand um, that they have to keep up with but again there are a lot of uh, entrants and uh, we're getting more 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 sophisticated too when it comes to um, the delivery of them so uh, I mean watch this space I guess is my answer to okay. you because uh, it's it's an area that we're focused on to see how we can most effectively deploy them Chairman, I think there, there's a resiliency play here oh, too yeah. with the buses, with the school buses, right? Because with all those electric buses sitting in a location, they become one big battery right, yeah. that can be used to supply mm -hmm. potentially the building yeah. uh, or the system, right? Oh. Yeah. No, I mean that goes yeah, exactly to 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 the innovation and things in terms of yeah the microgrids and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even as you say that, we'll start with the hurricane. And the ability to charge without power, you've got, you know, all the yep. rest of there was a little bit of that on the neutral the last yeah. yep. couple of days. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's interesting um, because when uh, Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico previously, uh, uh, we, um, past company looked at sending a, uh, an electric bus there so that individuals could go and basically charge yeah. their laptops, right. charge their phones, et cetera. So yes, it's it, it definitely what yeah. Justin was saying in terms of being able to leverage that for resiliency. 
Anything else? And there's nothing wrong with all green. No, know? I okay. Well, it's my Chris favorite is color, as Joe Grislo <laughs> remembers. Green, green, green is good. Green it is, is good. green is good. And like so, I said, it's my favorite color, genuinely. Yeah, hol <laughs> the holidays are coming, but you know, green works, green <laughs> works just fine. Okay. So, well Great. done, Sarah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh Adam, uh we, uh, you updated us uh, in the finance committee a couple of weeks ago, but uh, for the benefit of a uh, broader audience, uh, please sure. do so again. Yep, on, on the theory of, or the continuation of the color of green, money's green and- <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> and uh, well, good morning, trustees, NIPA colleagues, members of the public. And uh, yes, yeah, so as a continuation of what we spoke about at finance committee, um, well, we're not having quite as good a year as Aaron Judge. <laughs> we're, we're still doing pretty good in beating our targets. We don't want to be measured, you know, it's, we're not free agents either. You know, right. <laughs> for us, you know, so. But the, the themes continue in terms of revenues being as strong as Sarah mentioned in terms of uh, our energy prices and where we've locked in our hedging this year. and. Uh, although we are seeing some softening um, in general commodity prices, some you know, gas prices are lower, energy prices have gone lower in the last few weeks, um, but still above where we had uh, projected. So we see strong, um, uh, strong trends to continue as of the, through August, we were at a net income of 100 million versus a target of 42. And um, again, uh, revenue strong expenses tracking to budget uh, some additional expenses in the monetized funds. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but you know, overall, um, you know, ahead of schedule in terms of our actuals. If we go to the next slide, in terms of our year-end projection, we've you know raised it. I think we said last time it was at the higher end of that range, so we raised that range. Still remaining somewhat conservative, but um, we think we'll be somewhere between that 118 and a 135 uh, coming in at the end of the year. As I mentioned, uh, expenses in terms of O and M, um, you know, still still in line with budget overall. Um, other expenses are are higher, uh, mostly due to the monetized funds, of which you know those are additional funds that come in when we generate more power than a tariff. So the majority of that goes into the Western New York fund, um, and then we have the Northern New York fund, which gets a little bit. And as you, we've discussed in previous meetings, we've accelerated the industrial incentive award for the Erie County Harbor Development uh, Corporation. And that was 27 million. And then we have 5 million for a potential future program to address uh, curtailments. Uh, so we put that there as well. Uh, we've had some additional provisions in certain areas, but again, um, overall, you know, running ahead in all areas and not just in generation, but also in transmission. Uh, as we continue to build more, uh, build out the transmission that we've been discussing in the Joe's report, we're seeing you know, higher revenues from that and more of our you know, efforts and expenses throughout the organization are certainly um, being consumed with um, the area of, of transmission. Uh, but you know, we are still in very volatile times. We see a lot of headwinds in the economy. Uh, inflation is still not yet under control. Um, so we're you know, keeping an eye on that. The Fed is being taking more vigorous actions. We see rates going to at least four and a half percent by the year end probably peaking somewhere in the first quarter, second quarter of um, 23, so long as we see peak inflation. But at that same point, I think where the, you know, right now the economists are saying that a recession is likely. Um, so we have to take that into consideration and it's having an effect on the, on jobs, employment, the stock market, I think we all see that. So all of that is having a, and an effect on you know, consumer demand in general. So these are all the, uh, inflation, the economic signs we're looking at. Uh, obviously Russia, Ukraine still you know, top of mind in terms of how it impacts the energy markets. Europe is also in a recession and it's gonna be difficult for them also getting through the winter if they don't have gas supply. So we'll see some effects of that as well. Other uh, than that, things are pretty simple. Yes. <laughs> so it, it, right, it, given all that, turmoil and volatility, I think we consider ourselves pretty fortunate to be yeah. sort of where we are. Um, and also just, you know, aside from all those financials on um, just in terms of budget and your materials, uh, there were two things. One is that when it was sent to the trustees, the 630 financials that are not audited, but those uh, 630 full financials with, you know, 
footnotes, et cetera, being sent to our banks, rating agencies, and others. So um, those were in the materials as well as the filing of our 2801, uh, which is required by the public authorities law, which is more of a, an outward looking cash type projection. So it's not really relating back to our financials, but it's a requirement under the public authorities um, accountability act. And we also filed uh, recently with FERC um, new issues about our expenses in terms of how we allocate our costs and depreciate our assets. So that filing has gone in and been approved. Um, that will also help us fine tune how we, uh, how we manage our expenses and our revenues. Uh, if there are any other questions, it will certainly open up to- well, we haven't asked one yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there can't be any other. We have <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the net of all you just talked about in terms of uh, ramifications, market dynamic, et cetera, you're saying it doesn't really, you don't expect it to have any net impact uh, between now and the balance of the year. That's correct. Moving parts and pieces uh, where we'll be. What's your <clears throat> first look at crystal ball for 23 relative to 22 for all of our lighthearted commentary earlier? Um, what goes around comes around. Uh, how do you expect uh, you know trends to look going into 23 in terms of market and what we've benefited from or what we've been you know hurt by here? What's your first crack at a 23 crystal ball? At yeah, so I, I think 23 is going to look a lot like 22 in many ways. Um, you know, we are getting to that point where we're trying to hedge. Uh, a lot of next year's energy. And while I said there has been some softening, it's, it's still gonna be stronger than what we budgeted for this year. Uh, as far as interest rates go, the impact on us um, will be minor for the short term because we've locked in our uh, right. long-term financing right. in April. We were able to get a 3.6. Which looks all the more. Which well, looks so all the more better, good, right? Good again yeah, yep. get, getting in and out and uh, our short term uh, borrowing has come way down. As I mentioned we, in earlier meetings, we sold off um, over 300 million of our energy efficiency loans. So we brought that down from 500 to 200. So that'll reduce our, our, our short-term borrowing costs, which was being used to, to fund that. Um, investment income should go up because we should be able to earn more on our portfolio. So that'll actually be a positive in terms of the interest rates. But given what's going on in the stock market, it will put, potentially put some pressure on our OPEB expense, but certainly put pressure on our pension expense. I would assume next year's pension expense is going to be a lot higher for everybody, but particularly for entities like us, the MTA and the Port Authority that are on GASB uh, 68 accounting. It's a, it's a more you know, uh, punitive uh, accounting pronouncement in terms of how the uh, pension uh, reacts to changes in the stock market. And I, unless there's a you know, miraculous turnaround between now and March 31st, I'm assuming that the state pension fund will be underperforming their uh, uh, their bogey, which is now 5.9%. I mean, the good thing is that they did bring that down from eight, so that helps, but it'll still be significant. I get some bad pension from pension. a higher discount rate, but yeah, yep. I hear you. Oh. So, I mean, that's what we're really seeing. And, you know, in terms of the inflation and other things like that, I think we are, you know, working, as we mentioned at the last meeting, working with our, our partners in SSM and project management and coming up with ways that we can mitigate costs in terms of our big rock capital projects and try to get ahead of some of that as well. So as you've begun to plan in you know, 423, yeah, there's a lot on the table, a lot on the agenda, <clears throat> our ability to continue to fund and lean in, you know, we can we're, we remain confident, um, you know, in terms of our ability to match our resources with the demands and requests of us. Absolutely, and we're looking at it regularly. So yeah, there's a lot of work coming down the, the pipe, pipeline. And, and in that area, you know, we're trying to be more innovative in our financing, uh, looking at other structures like project finance, um, public-private partnerships, you know, potentially bringing in private financial partners for some of our bigger projects so that we can, you know, take you know, a certain amount of money instead of doing five projects to 10 or 15 leverage our dollars. Yep. So we're looking at all that and obviously working with uh, the chamber as well in, in terms of uh, the various federal bills that are out there and federal funding. And we've been talking with them about ways in which um, we can be able to participate in some of that as well so that we can do some of the projects that are important to the state and the governor. And as I think, you know, again, kudos for just our ability to leverage in more challenging times, the strength of the balance sheet and the strong position mm -hmm. we're in. And 
Uh, well, we're not recession proof. No one ever is, but uh, yeah, we're able to continue to you know push forward. So well done uh, yep. to you and the, and the team and the entire organization. Any <laughs> other questions uh, for Adam? Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, Phil, yes. uh, speaking of big projects and a lot going on, <laughs> give us a drive-by. Sure. A flyover. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees, staff, and guests. I'm pleased to provide the latest update on the NIPA development uh, projects that are currently under construction or in various phases of development. Um, so the first, we'll start with the, the Smart Path project. Um, this project is rebuilding our Moses Adirondack transmission lines. Um, right now we're on track to complete the Moses Adirondack 2 line, uh, complete construction on that uh, this November. Um, shortly after that, we'll roll into construction on the Moses Adirondack 1 line, which we expect to complete next May. Um, currently on the Moses Adirondack 2 line, uh, we have 124 out of 133 foundations complete. So that's about 93% complete. The remainder of those uh, foundations we expect to complete, um, uh, I'll say next week, within the next week or so. Uh, so on track there. Um, all materials on site. Um, as far as uh, demolition on the uh, Mosetta around the two line, that's pretty much um, well underway. Um, uh, no issues there as far as staying on top of that. Uh, to complete the construction. On the Moses Adirondack one line, like I said, we expect to start um, the construction on that in December uh, once we wrap up the Moses Adirondack two line. Um, along that line, um, I'll say most of the materials are on site, uh, but no issues as far as uh, delivery that we expect to, to in, um, inhibit the uh, product uh, construction of that line. Um, the team did experience a number of um, outage delays or um, cancellations with the New York ISO this summer uh, because of, of weather. It was it was hot, and uh, you know at during certain periods they halt construction uh, just to make sure there's no system impacts. But even weathering through those, um, the construction is still on track. So the team did an excellent job with our, our construction um, contract partners. Uh, so everything's moving along there. Um, smart path, um, yeah, smart path phase two. So there was a portion on smart path, um, that was permitted under phase one. Um, but it was construction was really timed with smart path connect, which I'll get to in a second here. Um, but, uh, we have one potential reroute, uh, associated with, uh, construction near the dam up at Messina. Uh, so the team's working through that to make sure there's no technical issues there. Uh, but uh, construction on that continues and um, that's well underway to uh, complete on time as well. Um, moving along to Smart Path Connect, uh, not sure if the last time, but if I mentioned this, but we did receive our Article 7 award from the Public Service Commission. So that was on track. And I think within the last week, we received our Environmental Management <coughs> Construction Permit as well. Uh, so that is on track to start construction uh, very shortly here in October. So um, that will be another upgrade of the um, Moses Willis lines, as well as continuation down to uh, eventually down to the Utica area with the national grid portion um, and the partnership with them on, on the development of that project. Um, let's see, contracts are all in place for that. Materials, um, contracts are in place. The other thing that um, our licensing group within uh, business development uh, took care of is um, pre-construction meeting uh, with the regulators and the contractors just to make sure everybody's aligned as far as how that will progress. So a lot of detailed work going into that in preparation to start construction and remain on track for that project. Next slide, please. Um, Central East Energy Connect is a project we're working on with LS Power New York. Um, mentioned last time that LS Power is having some technical issues with energization of the Gordon Road substation. Those issues have been resolved. Um, they began energizing that substation line by line. So they're taking it one line at a time. Um, I believe two out of the three lines have been energized now. The remainder of that work is expected to be completed next week. Um, that project is about 48% complete. 
um, with the, the target to finish that at the uh, end of 2023. So things are moving along there uh, well underway and no issues to report as far as the continuation of that line. Next slide, please. Um, Clean Path New York, uh, that's the uh, tier four project that we're working on with Forward Power. Um, the team is working very hard on the Article 7 preparation. The target date is to uh, submit the Article 7 application um, in October, uh, working with Forward Power. Which means what? <laughs> um, the Article 7 application is the Public Service Commission review uh, with all of the um, interested parties, whether it's uh, DEC, landowners along the right, the, the right of way, um, commenting on that, going through, making sure that there's um, the justification for the construction of the line, there's a public need for the line, and then um, that the route and all of the associated uh, work with that line is in compliance with, uh, with the regulations. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so we're working on that 173-mile um, line. Uh, the majority of that will be in the existing NIPA of right away. So we have a few, we're calling them micro reroutes associated with the line due to um, terrain, um, logistics of the line construction. There's a lot of going through the Catskills. There's a lot of um, uh, steep slopes, ravines, river crossings. So we, we, there are some instances where we have to get additional right away. So we're working with forward power just to finalize that routing. Um, communicating with our landowners, a lot of communications with elected officials, uh, communities along the way. As a matter of fact, this evening we have a meeting with the uh, Manhattan Community Board uh, because this line will eventually go through the New York City area, um, landing um, at the uh, Astoria location in New York, in Queens. So um, a lot of that public communications, making sure that everybody's aware of what we're doing, answering any questions, resolving those issues. Um, in anticipation of submittal of our Article 7, just to make sure everything's lined up beforehand. So um, that work is going on as we speak. Um, we're also working on details on the landing at Astoria substation, uh, working on the technical and layout details with Forward Power, um, as well as um, working with our commercial operations team and utility operations on how we integrate the use of BG for energy storage into that project. Uh, to make sure that we're protecting our rights, our interests at BG, as well as optimizing the utilization of that for um, the forward power and the tier four um, renewable energy getting into New York City. Um, Propel New York. Um, unfortunately, um, we, were, uh, we were anticipating that we would hear fourth quarter of this year from the New York ISO on that solicitation the latest news, it will be first quarter of next year. So uh, the team is working very hard together with New York Transco, addressing any New York ISO um, requests for information, technical details, um, addressing those issues, uh, supporting that. We did do some um, presentations at the New York ISO. We're expecting to do another one at the New York ISO as well as with stakeholders just to address any questions or concerns that may come out of that. Uh, given the location of that in the New York City, Long Island area, a lot of uh, routing uh, concerns, issues uh, associated with that. So uh, team is working well uh, with Transco, uh, just working very hard to make sure that we're prepared uh, for the uh, eventual uh, award of that by the New York ISO. Again, first quarter of next year, um, we're one of, we have six proposals that are still in the running with, uh, with multiple proposals from other developers. Next slide. Um, just a few other updates that we have. Um, the development team through our um, licensing group is supporting utility operations on a number of projects. Um, the Y49 project, um, the repair or um, upgrade of that line to address the reliability issues we've had. Uh, the team has worked through to help get the um, environmental management construction plan in place to support the construction of that. And um, that work has started with the installation of additional manholes um, in anticipation of replacement of uh, some of the underground line there. Um, also supporting them for the environmental management construction plans on the communications backbone work uh, that's going on to uh, install fiber optics along our right-of-way. Um, and lastly, 
Um, the New York ISO has initiated the next round of FERC Order 1000 public policy transmission needs assessments. Um, so they're seeking comments from uh, market participants. Um, we're anticipating uh, that solicitation to go out to the street next year sometime uh, once the PSC um, follows the regulatory process there. But we're monitoring, uh, providing comments on where we think the needs are for the next round, just to make sure that um, when Joe talked about all of those projects and the amount of generation that's proposed in the state, making sure that as that generation is built, there's pathways to get that to the load center. Uh, so we're just monitoring that closely and staying um, um, involved in that process to make sure that our technical input is, uh, is considered as part of that as well. And I just want to state, I've stated this before, but, you know, I talk about the construction of these projects. We work very closely. You know, we're, we're kind of the recruiter out there finding the next uh, quarterback or uh, defensive end that the team needs. Utility operations is there uh, managing these in the construction phase. We work closely with them. Um, we're also working closely with utility operations um, as part of the strategic vision tactics to make sure that we have the building blocks. When we get these solicitations, uh, the New York ISO PPTN process is an example. We have 90 days to respond. We need to make sure that we have the building blocks. Uh, we don't have the time to go through that detailed engineering um, during that process. So making sure we have the building blocks to be able to develop the projects um, that are constructible for the price that we submit um, within the time frame that we also submit. So working on all those issues across the board, the support from the other parts of the organization um, have been, has it's been tremendous as far as helping us um, succeed. And I just wanna end with, you know, Joe talked about the amount of projects we have and others have as well. I, I've been in the utility business in New York for 30 years. I can't recall a time when, you know, utilities had maybe one or two small sections of 345 KV lines under construction. We Starting next week, when we start Smart Path Connect, we'll have three separate um, 345 kV double circuit lines under construction simultaneously. So just a tremendous lift for the, um, the power authority, but also showing the uh, amount of effort that will be required to meet the state CLCPA goals. Thank you. Any questions? Great update. Appreciate that. A lot of moving parts and pieces, yeah. obviously, there. Plates overflowing. So appreciate the collective effort that uh, you just referenced. And just uh, just a plug for Phil and his team uh, in the uh, the new study that came out of the transmission needs uh, that are going to be uh, studied now by the ISO. Um, we had we had identified the same pockets of transmission need, so we've been studying them for several years now, right? Yes. So we're going to have an advantage yeah. as we as we go forward. Right. Terrific, terrific. Anything else for Phil? Anything? Phil, thanks very much. Thank for you. They appreciate the great work and uh, the time to. Keep us current. Uh, as I said up front, while we talk canals uh, with regularity, we want to periodically hear right from uh, the source. So uh, pleased to have Brian Stratton here today to give us a uh, drill a little deeper on the good work that's been done over the last uh, little bit, more importantly, where we're going forward. So, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and uh, welcome, trustees and uh, my fellow NIPA and CANALS employees, members of, of, of the public and all here, I am happy to have the opportunity to be here. It is, it is exciting to be able to come to White, 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 White Plains. Usually my travel takes me in the, in the opposite direction uh, between Albany and, Albany and Buffalo, just like the song. Uh, I travel the canal, but I am I am pleased to be here. Excellent, we're and, pleased to have you. And we have had a great or a great season. Uh, we are beginning to uh, come to the end of end of our season. Uh, we will wrap up about October fifteenth, um, and maybe a couple of weeks after that, wrapping up the hundred and ninety eighth consecutive season of navigation along the canals. And I am happy to report that navigation is up. The things that we are doing to make the canal stronger, to make to make the canal better, to do all of the great great ideas, great ideas um, seem to be paying off. Overall, navigation is up fourteen point three percent over last year. And actually, as you know, we have four canal systems. Navigation is up six point five percent on the Erie Canal. It is up by eighteen point five percent over last year on the Champlain Canal, up nearly ten percent 
on the on the on, on the Cayuga Seneca Canal and on the Oswego Canal, going from Syracuse to Oswego. Navigation is up 76.5%. Oh, B, you've been out there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She has been. Thank you, Pete. We, we've been we we've been fortunate. So we are very, 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 very happy. And I'm going to take you through some of the great projects that uh, we have had. Uh, I am also happy to report that uh, uh, Justin and I have had the opportunity to be out on the canal together many times over the past year, over the past uh, to ten months. And uh, I am also happy to report that Trustee Gonzalez. Uh, has been out there, and uh, we are extremely grateful for 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 her support, Chairman. We would love to see all of the trustees out on the canal, and uh, we welcome that opportunity. So, um, well, as soon as B invites us on to her boat, we'll all be there. You know, so. <laughs> She's got a big boat, so I think she can right, probably accommodate it. TMI, TMI. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just it's recognize rehab, all of the. the oh, yeah, it's a small little thing. No problem. Let me just uh, say thank you to all of the the, the Eureka Eureka winners. I think that we yeah. can we 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 can find relevance uh, in the canals in all of those presentations, and we are particularly proud, as I said, of our own canal winner, Marissa. And we look forward to following up on that. R R Rebecca Hughes and I are serving as her executive sponsors, so we are going to work very very sure. closely nice. with her. Um, what I'm going to show you, uh, give you today is an update on our reimagined canals, canals program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the operational challenges that we have on the earthen embankments and then wrap up with a very exciting event coming to Buffalo in 2025, and that is the World Canals Conference. So big things ahead. First of all, reimagine the canals highlights uh, and working on the screen left to right. The Brockport Pedestrian Bridge, which is going to be a fabulous project connecting the SUNY Brockport campus to the Empire State Trail, um, have reached the 90% design phase, at which point we held a community meeting uh, in Brockport on May 25th to gauge public support. And although the meeting started out with some residents raising concerns about safety and about and about maintenance, mm -hmm. uh, I am happy to say that our great team turned that around and that meeting actually ended in applause and a standing oh, 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 ovation. Doesn't always happen on, <laughs> on the canal that, that, that way, Mr. Chairman, but uh, we are happy that in, in, well done. in this well done. instance, we, 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 we did a great job. So Brockport is ready. And this is gonna be a great project. And in fact, we are looking forward to the opportunity Talking now, Justin and I talking about possibly bringing uh, a future trustees General meeting. General Clarence Wilson Foundation is, is uh, that? You, that that is correct, sir. Okay, great. Uh, the Ralph C. C. Wilson Foundation. I'm yep. going through my through my talking points so so fast that I am uh, overlooking that. But in addition to the funding that uh, we are putting in, uh, the Brockport Bridge has also secured a 1.2 million dollar federal grant from the TAP program, Transportation Alternative. Pro, uh, uh, pro, pro, pro program tap grant and in 2000 the ralph c the ralph c wilson foundation excuse me 2020 2020 the ralph c wilson foundation gave us a two million dollar grant That's so uh 3.2 million dollars in uh opm other people's money mm -hmm. Uh, so that is going forward. In the center of the screen, the Cayuga Whitewater Water Course. Uh, if there ever there was a challenge along the canal, this is it uh, to to navigate the white the, the white water. This project advanced to the to thirty percent design fees phase. Mike and I are going to take that on. We're ready for you. We'll be ready for you, but we have to get a private developer first. Uh, <laughs> the project team uh, D, D determined that this project is best positioned for a private de private developer and cons and cons and cons cons concessionaries model. So the reimagined team has issued a RFI for a private private developer. So we will keep you posted on that, and we will bring that vision to life along the Cayuga Seneca Canal. 
What's and a then, realistic timeline for that, Brian? Well, obviously, we have to get the results of, 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 of the RFI, but we would think, what, two to three years, okay. Rebecca? Um, so we'll keep you posted. I look forward to coming back and so I got training and time yet. keeping okay. you updated. That's right. You've got time to get in shape for the whitewater. Thank you. And then all the way to the right is Guy Park. Guy Park, Guy Park Manor, a beautiful historic manor located along uh, the Erie Canal in the city of Amsterdam at Lock, Lock 11. And you may recall that this site was severely damaged in uh, 2011 by the onslaught of uh, Hurricane I Irene and tr tr Tropical Storm Lee, not five months after I began. <clears throat> Uh, on the job, so this has been this has been devastated, uh, and uh, the project is going to be coming back to life under under the reimagined canals 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 program. We have received a four point six million dollar FEMA grant that will be used to support this, and the site, as reconstructed, will house cultural and institutional tenants who will offer community benefits while also supporting operation and maintenance. And then as the project moves into its second phase, we, it will be a public park, which will highlight features of history and the environment. So work is gonna be getting underway very, very soon. That is the Guy Park Manor along the Erie Canal in the city of Amsterdam. Next slide, Carly, please. Um, Earthen embankments, uh, you've, I'm sure you have heard these talked about uh, before many of the canal sections, particularly in the western section, are actually uh, earth, earthen embankments built up. You might think of a, of a canal being dug into the ground. This is, this is actually where the canal is actually raised. And so those embankments, which can be as high as 50, 60 feet tall, are actually holding back water. So they're really, they're really levees. So extremely con concerning, they're old and we have to keep them strong and safe. So we have contracted with three an engineering firms to assess the canal segments in Western New York where most of the elevated embankments are, are located. Each of these three firms has presented large scale engineering options to address the embankment integrity in a comprehensive manner. And in addition, NIPA dam, 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 dam safety staff recently completed engineering uh, assessments for all the canal waste weirs um, in this area. Those are the those are the devices that actually drain water out of the canals. We have we have we have overflow. We have water control. These assessments are in addition to the temporary temporary measures that have been put in place this year across the western region of the canal. Largely, that spans from Rochester out to Medina, and uh, those measures include monitoring and and inspections and reduced reduced water levels. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, as we all know, emergency management is always a top, a, a, a top, top, top priority, even when it takes us out, out outside of the outside of the outside of the outside of the the, 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 the canal area proper. Uh, dam safety uh, is a very important topic. And uh, we actually have three reservoirs that are located in remote regions of the Adirondack Park. And that would be Woodhall Dam, South Lake Dam, and North Lake Dam. And in fact, Woodhall Dam, which I believe might be the picture in the center, is so so remote that it it is it, it is accessible only by boats and barges. So we have gone in by boat and, and and by barge to try to get get an assessment on these. All of these all of these rivers, all these reservoirs actually date back to the B and large period of uh, of the canal in 1850. So these are these are assets that have long been under our purview and we're right. doing our best to make sure that they're safe, even better yet to get them out of our hands and into someone else's. And then finally, we all know that emergency management is in fact job job number one, even when it takes us out 
outside of the canal. And earlier this month, as many state and local agencies were called upon to help us answer the call to battle brush fires at Minnewaska State Park within the Hudson Valley. The Canal Corporation actually answered the call by providing the use of its new D6 bulldozer operated by our own Cody Oldham out of Canal section number two. So thank you, Cody, for helping us answer the call to, to support that. I've never seen the D6 bulldozer, but it looks like a fabulous piece of equipment. Next slide, Carly. Final, fin finally, Mr. Chairman, we uh, well, Governor, <laughs> Governor Kathy Hochul announced in June, I think it was on June 4th, that New York State has won the rights to host the 2025 World Canals Conference, which will bring together hundreds of canal in, 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 inland waterways and in, 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 in enthusiasts, professional scholars from uh, around the world. And uh, I had the opportunity to attend the World Canals Can Conference this year, the 22 World Canals Conference in Leipzig, Germany. And this was a fabulous gathering. We learn, we learn a lot. We learn a lot from what is happening in every canal system and in every uh, inland waterway system all, all, all around the world. So the 2025 conference, of course, is, is well-timed because that will mark 200 years from the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. So big things are going to be happening there. And even though we are bringing the World Canals Conference there, probably in September of 25, uh, the Erie Canal Harbor, Har Harbor Development Corporation is already well underway with a series of uh, summer long events that are going to be celebrated at the Canal Side, Canal Side District and uh, up. Uh, culminated with the World's Canal Conference in 2025. We will be joined by our, our partners, the Power Authority and the Canal Corporation have already begun to meet with our partners for this. And that includes the Erie Canal Heritage Corridor, the Erie Canal Har 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 Harbor Development Corporation and Visit Buffalo Niagara. So we've got some good team players. Although we are going to show off, show off, show off Canal side, uh, this, conference theme is actually forward forward thinking and it is going to embrace our our discussions of innovation opportunities and challenges which drive healthy and sustainable waterways of of the world today and furthermore it will provide us just in three years from now the opportunity to show off everything that we have done over the past four, four years to make our make our canals safer, stronger, and more popular. This is the fourth time that the World Canals Conference will be held in our state. Yeah. It was held in Rochester in 2000 and in 2010, again in Syracuse in 2017, when we marked 200 years since construction of the Erie Canal began in Rome, Oneida County. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I will make sure that to keep you and, and the trustees updated as we move forward to Buffalo 2025. Thank yep. you. That, in, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer Everyone whatever questions Everyone in Buffalo looks have. forward to hosting. So. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a question. Terrific. Thanks very much, Brian. That's a great Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. overview. Appreciate that very much. Well done. Trustee uh, Gonzalez. Brian, when um, can we see the economic development impact of reimagining canals, right? Because I think the two stories complement each other. That's a very good point. We're, we're going to be doing a uh, economic impact study very, very soon. Uh, you know, we have a lot of a, a lot of figures. Uh, certainly, it's uh, tourism is a very important economic impact. However, non-tourism non uses, hydropower, water. Um, uh, we, we did a 2014 story, uh, 2014 study, and that determined that the non-tourism uh, impact was 6.4 billion. So it's absolutely huge. So we have a, a, a great opportunity both on the tourism and on the non tourism front but let's get more of these projects into place yeah it's just and then say, be able to uh right. yeah. to it's, be able to spin it's a long, off from longer that. term play certainly and we've you know accepted that uh but that's important why you know we've wanted to pivot from mm -hmm. you know to reimagine the canals because of the upside opportunity and what can be done to leverage the historic success for even uh a, you know a multiple of that in the years ahead so 
Yeah. Because I'm assuming the 76% increase at the Oswego Canal has to do with the focus, laser focus the mayor of Oswego has put into. Well, it's true. We worked We worked with them. We have eight locks along the canal from uh, Phoenix to uh, Oswego. They're, they previously were not opened and closed all, all, all at the same time. We put them all, mm -hmm. all on a consistent schedule. So they opened up at uh, 7 a.m. They closed at 10 p.m. or 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 9 p.m. Uh, Wego's got some great economic development going on, and I will I will confess for full disclosure those numbers are also based on the fact that we were closed on the the the, 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 the uh, Canal for quite a bit of time last year. So yep. that there's one of the micro the benefits, you know, individual yeah. benefits. The cumulative lift will take some time, but. The other thing is that uh, it's just a consistent focus. I mean, yeah. Brian, Rebecca, the team, everybody's done a you know just, fantastic job. Just for awareness, when you look at that picture of the um the embankment, what you're you not that seeing down. is that there are residential neighborhoods at the bottom of those embankments, which only heighten correct the safety issues concerned with with the yeah, this, integrity of those embankments. This 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 doesn't show the 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 great embankment, which is a uh, very historic engineering feature of the canal, which runs approximately from Pittsford to Brighton, um, is about sixty feet tall. It was huge, a great great engineering feat, but it is a dam. It is a dam holding back holding back water, and there are houses and homes and schools. Right. Uh, right yep. at the foot of that. So we also need to be able to weed this out so we can actually see this, see the canal too. So we can see if we have if we have water, water, water coming out. Uh, we actually have people that actually walk walk the towpath and they look their job all day long is to look down down the embankment stand to look 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 for problems. So if you're retired and, and you want to get in shape, great opportunity. Well, so, uh, uh, I'm going to look for, I'm going to look forward at the agenda. So I'm going to give you the hook. Uh, you, great, Mr. great report. Appreciate the time. Well done. And uh, kudos to you and your team for uh, making real meaningful progress. Obviously, we're all in. It's a significant investment for us and uh, very pleased to see uh, the beginnings of uh, the pivot and the benefits of making you know, the turn to reimagine the canals and excited for what the future holds and excited to hear in the future more from you, Rebecca, and, and everyone. So thank you for your time today very, very much. Um, earlier today, we had a uh, governance committee report uh, very enably uh, chaired for uh, the initial time by our new governance committee chair, Ms. Gonzalez, uh, B, would you uh, give us a little report and update, please? Absolutely. So during the governance committee meeting this morning, we received an update on the diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, which encompassed DEI competency reinforcement, the diverse business community assistance program, and a PTEC update. The team continues to expedite their plan to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion across the organization and in external relationships. The team presented their progress to date and the status of their programs. We also received an update and learned something new, some of us, um, on resource alignment and insights on workforce succession planning and process excellence Kaizen events, right? <laughs> we had a moment, we had a Kaizen moment. <laughs> we had a Kaizen moment. Finally, the committee adopted a consent agenda, which included the vessel naming recommendation in honor of famed American abolitionist Harriet Tubman. Um, a few routine annual reports were covered and the meeting minutes from the last meeting. Um, the vessel renaming recommendation is before the board for adoption. And as you referenced it earlier, we're excited, proud to uh, do that. And uh, if I could have a second to uh, that second. motion. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, unless there's any other discussion, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carried. We're excited to have a... Harriet Tubman represented in our fleet. So well done. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, in Tracy McKibben's uh, absence, uh, I'll give a quick uh, report on our finance committee meeting of uh, a couple of weeks ago and a handful of items uh, uh, that we need to Bless act you. on here. Bless you. Uh, a, uh, as always, uh, a robust discussion on a wide uh, uh, range of uh, initiatives that uh, we continue to 
underwrite and support, some of which uh, were referenced, uh, frankly, earlier in the discussions today. Uh, in the canals uh, recommendation uh, to approve our quarterly uh, subsidy of uh, 21.3 million uh, as part of our uh, ongoing uh, annual operating uh, support for the canals. Uh, if you recall, there's a recommendation to approve a $32.9 million contract uh, with Ferguson Electric in connection uh, with the life extension and modernization program um, at Niagara. Um, Sarah mentioned the expansion extension of uh, the EV uh, initiative uh, up, up to uh, upwards of 250 million uh, and the additional approvals uh, to uh, subsidize and support all of that. Adams uh, talked to us in the past about the establishment of uh, a captive uh, insurance company and the benefits that uh, will accrue going forward and the opportunities and flexibility uh, that creates for us. And uh, we also had a recommendation uh, for uh, uh, agile lab support for the next five years for uh, the sum of uh, upwards of uh, 20 million. So those are five separate initiatives uh, that I would ask for a motion to approve in a second. Thank you very much, Dennis and Mike. Uh, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed, uh, those motions are carried. Um, our consent agenda, um, hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to review. Uh, if there's any questions, happy to entertain. Otherwise, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thanks, Michael. Second, Dennis. Uh, all in favor, aye. aye. Uh, motion carried. Uh, that concludes uh, our agenda for the day. So unless there's uh, any other matters to come before us, our next meeting um, is uh, December 13th. Hard to think about uh, December already. Uh, the bills will be well established uh, as Super Bowl uh, favorites uh, by mid-December. So we look forward to celebrating uh, that. Um, and uh, I thank everyone uh, for their uh, time and attention today. Congratulations again, Eureka Challenge uh, winners and all Eureka Challenge participants. more time, Brian, Rebecca, thank you very much for uh, your time and uh, the update. Exciting uh, to hear all that. Justin and team uh, bring home the bacon in the fourth quarter. We look forward to hearing all of that. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, all that. Aye. 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 Have a great day. Uh, enjoy, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.